Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back, Judge Kavanaugh. Thank you, Senator. Thank you again for your service. Uh, before I get into questions, I just want to take a minute uh, to recognize and thank the, the outstanding work at this hearing by the Capitol Police in, in terms of, in a calm and professional manner, dealing with the unfortunate disruptions we've seen and maintaining an environment where this hearing can focus on the record and substance uh, of this nominee. And so thank you for the, the tremendous work uh, that the men and women here are doing. Mr. President, I think we'd like to second, and Senator Cruz, second that sentiment on our side as well. Th thanks both of you very much. I've expressed it to uh, many of the policemen individually as I see them. Proceed. Uh, start is 30 minutes over. Uh, judge Kavanaugh, let, let's start with just a, a, a general question. What, what makes a good judge? Senator, a good judge is independent, first of all, under our constitutional uh, system. Someone who's impartial, who is an umpire, who's not wearing the uniform of one litigant or another, of one policy or another. Someone who reads the law as written, informed by history and tradition and precedent in constitutional cases. The law is written, informed by the canons of construction that are settled in statutory cases, uh, that treats uh, litigants with respect, uh, that writes opinions uh, that are understandable and that resolve the issues. Um, I think civility and collegiality help make a, a good judge. A good judge understands that real people are affected in the real world, the, the litigants in front of them, but also the other people affected uh, by the decisions the judge uh, uh, decides or the court decides in a particular case. A uh, good judge pays attention to precedent, which is um, constitutional cases, of course, rooted in Article Three and critically important to the stability and predictability and reliance interests that are protected by the law. So there are a number of things that go into uh, making a good judge a, a work ethic. Uh, it's, it's hard work to dig in and uh, find the right answer in a particular case, and I think that's critically important as well, uh, judicial temperament. There are a lot of factors that go into it, and uh, that's, uh, those are some of them. I'm sure there are more. One of the things I was looking at, it's, it's striking uh, both the overheated rhetoric we have heard from some of our Democratic colleagues uh, and, and also from some of the protesters over the last two, two days. Um, I took a look at your record compared to that of, of Judge Merrick Garland. Uh, Judge Garland, of course, was appointed to the D.C. Circuit uh, by Bill Clinton, and he was President Obama's nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, what I found that was striking is that in, in the 12 years you've been on the D.C. Circuit, of all the matters that you and Chief Judge Garland have voted on together, that you voted together 93% of the time. Uh, not, o not only that, of the 28 published opinions that you've authored, where Chief Judge Garland was on the panel, Chief Judge Garland joined 27 out of the 28 opin opinions you issued when you were on a panel together. In other words, he joined 96% of the panel opinions that you've written when he was on a panel with you. And the same is true in the reverse. Of the 30 published opinions that Chief Judge Garland has written on a panel, you've joined 28 out of 30 of them, uh, over 93% of those opinions. Um, what is your reaction uh, to, to, to those, the, those data and the level of agreement? Well, I think we're trying hard to uh, find common ground and to as I've said before, he's a great judge, a great chief judge, and he's very careful and hard, very hardworking, and we work well together and try to read the statute as written, read the precedent as written, and uh, he's a judge who does not, like I try to be as well, judge who's not trying to impose any uh, personal preferences onto the decision, but take the law as written, and uh, that's what I, I've tried to do in those cases, and that probably explains uh, some of that. I think it also goes back to, I don't think, I think judges are distinct from policymakers, and I think that shows up when you uh, 
uh, dig into the actual details of how courts operate and go about their business. You, of course, know well, Senator, from your, all your arguments and seeing judges uh, decide cases in real time. And uh, I think those <clears throat> statistics reflect uh, reflect the reality of how judges go about their business. Uh, like I've said several times, I think of the Supreme Court as a team of nine and would try to be a team player on a team of nine. That, of course, there are going to be disagreements at times, so I don't want to overstate. Uh, but if you have that mindset of we're a court without sitting on different sides of an aisle, without being in separate caucus rooms, trying to find what the right answer is, and I think there is a right answer in many cases, uh, and uh, maybe uh, you know a, a range of reasonable answers and some others, uh, and uh, I think that's what those statistics reflect to me. So you talked about the difference between your own policy preferences and what the law described mm -hmm. or mandates. Mm -hmm. How would you describe a judicial activist? <clears throat> I would describe a judicial activist as someone who lets his or her personal or policy preferences override the best interpretation of the law, and that can go in either direction. So a judge who strikes down a law as unconstitutional when the text and precedent don't support that result, or a judge in the other direction who upholds a law as constitutional when the text and precedent would suggest that the law is in fact unconstitutional. So too in statutory cases, it's the same principle. When a judge does not stick with the compromises that you've reached and written into the text of the statute passed by Congress and signed by the president, but thinks uh, the judge can improve on it in some way or maybe picks a snippet out of a committee report and says, well, I agree with that review, uh, review in the committee report and I'm going to superimpose that onto the text of the statute passed by Congress. Uh, that's to me the textbook j definition of a judicial activist, adding to or subtracting from the text as informed by the precedent. In your time on the D.C. Circuit, you've written a number of opinions addressing separation of powers. Why does separation of powers matter? Why should, why should an American at home watching this on, on C-SPAN care about the separation of powers? <clears throat> um, people should care about separation of powers because it protects individual liberty. And it's really the foundational protection of individual liberty. We think of uh, the First Amendment, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, as foundational protections of individual liberty. But uh, as, as Justice Scalia used to say, the old Soviet Constitution had uh, a Bill of Rights, but it was meaningless in operation because they did not have an independent judiciary. They did not have a separation of powers system to help protect those individual liberties. So uh, it works in two ways, I think, or more than two ways. First, the, ind the independent judiciary that helps enforce those rights. Secondly, the whole structure, as I've explained, tilts toward liberty in the sense that you start with a system, it's hard to pass a law to affect what you do or cannot do, hard to get a law through Congress, and that's by design. There's a, the, the uh, bicameralism uh, principle, a House and a Senate, uh, and as well as adding the president, was designed to prevent the passions of the moment from overwhelming and enacting a law based on the passions as opposed to a more difficult process. That all helps protect individual liberty. Then even after you pass a law, the president has, as I was discussing with Senator Klobuchar, some prosecute or the executive branch has prosecutorial discretion when and how to enforce particular laws. Who is protected by prosecutorial discretion? Ultimately, it protects individual liberty. And then even when the Congress has passed a law and the executive has enforced a law, that doesn't mean you go straight to prison. You go, if you're charged with a crime, you go before an independent ju uh, judiciary. And just to add further protections for liberty, you have a jur the jury protections that are in the, in the original text of the Constitution and also reflected in the Bill of Rights. So in check after check after check, the Constitution tilts toward individual liberty. The separation of powers also ensures that there are checks on the branches. So what do we do for, uh, uh, for example, members of Congress don't serve for life. You have to run for re-election, uh, and that's a check 
again, to help protect individual liberty, to help ensure accountability as well, so too with presidents. So the, the document's just chock full with protections of individual liberty, and that's ultimately why the separation of powers matters uh, as much as the individual protections that are in the Bill of Rights and also in Article I, Section 9, Article I, Section 10 of the original Constitution. How about the doctrine of federalism? That, that's been an issue you haven't encountered as much serving on the D.C. Yeah. Circuit. But uh, can you share with this committee why federalism matters and, again, why, why Americans watching this hearing at home should, should care about the principles of federalism? <clears throat> federalism matters for several reasons, Senator. Um, again, it helps further individual liberty in the sense of uh, additional protection. So let me give you an example. If the, if the U.S. Constitution only protects, the Fourth Amendment only protects your against unreasonable searches and seizures up to a certain line, it's possible that your state constitution will protect you even further uh, under that, or your state legislature might protect you further. So further protections of individual liberty. Federalism also operates in a different way, a laboratory of democracy in the sense of experimentation around the country. There's not always the same uh, views in, in Texas that there might be in California, for example, on particular issues. And so you have different laws. <laughs> yes, and different laws in those states. And also, I think the federalism serves the, the more general idea of the government that's closest to you for most of your day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Uh, my wife's, of course, in local government uh, now as the town manager, but federalism for the things that affect you on a daily basis, the paving of the roads, the leaf collection, the trash collection, the, the um, local schools, which is probably the most direct uh, impact that many uh, people have with the government, the local court system. My mom, of course, was a state trial judge, the whole system of state government is most people's interaction with, uh, with government. And, and federalism, in that sense, makes uh, ensures accountability, because you know better, usually, your local and state elected officials than you do. And you can, therefore, make your views known on whatever uh, governmental issues uh, is uh, of concern to you. For example, the schools is a, is a classic one. So what is the importance and the relevance uh, of the Tenth Amendment? The Tenth Amendment uh, is, uh, protects federalism in the sense of ensuring that the states have independent sovereign, uh, they make clear, which is also clear from the structure, but reinforces the idea that the states are sovereign entities that have uh, independent uh, authority under the Constitution and that they have the status as separate sovereigns under the Constitution. And so you were Solicitor General of Texas, of course, and I know you represented the state of Texas in many cases where the sovereignty of the state of Texas to pass its laws and to enforce its laws was critical. And the sovereignty of the individual states is important for the people, again, both for the accountability, the local government, and also for the protection of individual liberty. And I think the Tenth Amendment uh, underscores that. It also makes, uh, it helps underscore something else, which is the states can't be commandeered by the federal government. Uh, commandeered is commandeering doctrine of the Supreme Court, which recognizes that, uh, and this is from the structure as a whole and underscored, but the federal government can't order states to, to do certain things that, um, the states themselves have not chosen to do. And so that's an important part of the federalism principles recognized by the Supreme Court, and that comes out of the Constitution as well. What do you make of the Ninth Amendment? Uh, Robert Bork famously described it as, a, as an inkblot. Uh, do you share that assessment? So I think the Ninth Amendment and the uh, Privileges and Immunities Clause and the Supreme Court's Doctrine of Substantive Due Process uh, are three roads that someone might take that all really lead to the same destination under the precedent of the Supreme Court now, which is that the Supreme Court precedent protects certain unenumerated rights so long as the rights are, as the Supreme Court said in the Glucksburg case, uh, rooted in history and tradition. And Justice Kagan explained this well in her confirmation hearing that the Glucksburg te test is, is quite important for 
allowing that protection of unenumerated rights that are rooted in history and tradition, which the precedent uh, definitely uh, establishes, but at the same time making clear that when doing that, judges aren't just enacting their own policy preferences into the Constitution. And an example of that is the, the old Pierce case where uh, Oregon passed a law that said everyone in the state of, this in the 1920s, everyone in the state of Oregon had to attend, uh, every student had to attend a public school. And a challenge was brought by that by parents who wanted to send their children to a parochial school, a religious school, and the Supreme Court ultimately upheld the rights of the parents to send their children to a religious parochial school and struck down that Oregon law. And that's one of the foundations of the unenumerated rights doctrine that's folded into the Glucksburg test and rooted in history and tradition. So uh, how you get there is, uh, there, as you know well, Senator, there's uh, stacks of law reviews written to the ceiling on, on all of that, whether it's privileges and immunity, substantive due process, or Ninth Amendment. But I think all roads lead to the Glucksburg test as the test that the Supreme Court has settled on as the proper test. Um, let's talk a little bit about the First Amendment. Uh, free speech, why is that an important protection for the American people? It's one of the bedrocks of American liberty, the ability to uh, say what you think, uh, to speak politically, first of all, about uh, policy issues and to speak about, uh, who, for example, who you want to support for elected office is a critical part of the free speech principle. Uh, but it's broader than that. It's the idea that uh, there is no one truth uh, necessarily that one person can dictate from on high in terms of policy issues or social issues or economic issues and that the truth or the, at least the best answer emerges after debate and over time and that freedom of speech is important to help advance uh, that cause of the debate. And it's important just as an individual matter, I think, to have that protection written into the Constitution because you may have an unpopular view uh, at a particular point in time, and if that were, view were suppressed, uh, that view would never take hold even though that view would be the better view. And so it's a particularly important in the Supreme Court precedent, I think, to protect unpopular views or views that seem uh, out of fashion or out of fashion at a particular moment in time because of both the inherent uh, dignity that that provides to individual people, but also for the broader purpose of that advances uh, societal progress or economic progress or social progress. Most good ideas were unpopular at one point or another and take time to uh, take hold in, in uh, and I think the framers understood that. Look, they were, look at where they came from and, and how they had to uh, fight against su suppression of speech and suppression also of religious liberty, of course, uh, in how they came about. So for the free speech is uh, critically important. I think, again, Justice Kennedy and Justice Scalia in Texas versus Johnson, what could be you know, more unpopular than burning the American flag, and yet they uh, upheld the right to do that, not because they liked it, and that's the whole point of Justice Kennedy's concurrence, but because they thought the First Amendment had to protect the most unpopular of ideas in order to accord with the precedent and principle of free speech. So you mentioned religious liberty. Uh, religious liberty is, is one of our fundamental liberties cherished uh, by Americans across the nation, the right to live according to our faith, according to our conscience. Uh, can, can you share your views on the importance of religious liberty and, and how the Constitution protects it? <clears throat> yes, Senator. Uh, to begin with, it's important in the original Constitution, even before the Bill of Rights, that the framers made clear in Article 6, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So that was very important in the original Constitution that the framers thought it very important that there not be a test to become a legislator, to become an executive branch official, to become a judge under religion. 
recognizing the, the religious freedom, at least to serve in public office. And then, of course, in the First Amendment to the Constitution, ratified in 1791, the principle of religious liberty is written right into the First Amendment to the Constitution. And uh, the framers understood uh, the importance of protecting conscience. It's uh, uh, akin to the free speech protection in many ways. And no matter what God you worship, or if you worship no God at all, you are protected as equally American, as I writ wrote in my New Dow opinion. And religions, if you have religious beliefs, religious people, religious speech, uh, you, ha you have just as much right uh, to be in the public square and to participate in the public programs as, as, as others do. You can't be denied just because you have a religious status. And the Supreme Court has articulated that principle in a, in a variety of different ways in particular cases. You look at, for example, In, in other countries around the world, uh, you know, in China, for example, uh, you uh, pu public. So, if you look uh, look at other countries around the world and. Uh, you're not as uh, you're not free to take your religion into the public square. You know, crosses are being knocked off churches, for example, or you can only practice in your own home. You can't practice. You can't bring your religious belief into the public square. Uh, in the uh, being able to participate in the public square is a part of the American tradition, I think, as a religious person, religious speech, religious ideas, religious thoughts. That's important. So, too, on the Establishment Clause, some of those, so, some of those cases are, as you know, particularly complicated in the Supreme Court precedent. But the Supreme Court precedent, for example, in the Town of Greece case and, and others, has recognized that uh, the, some religious traditions in, our, in governmental practices are rooted in, uh, sufficiently in history and tradition uh, to be upheld. And so in that case, the town of Greece case, the Supreme Court upheld the practice of a prayer before a local legislative meeting as Marsh v. Chambers, of course, also uh, a local town meeting, I should say. Marsh v. Chambers had upheld it in a legislative meeting as well. So the religious tradition uh, reflected in the First Amendment is a foundational part of American liberty, and it's important for uh, us as judges to recognize that and not and recognize too that, as with speech, unpopular religions are protected. Our job, we can uh, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, question the sincerity of a religious belief, meaning is someone lying or not about it. But they, we can't question the reasonableness of it, and so the Supreme Court has cases with. Uh, all sorts of religious beliefs protected. Justice Brennan, really the architect of that. So religious liberty is is critical to the uh, First Amendment and the um, the American Constitution. How would you describe the interaction between the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause? And and are they at cross purposes and in intention, or are they complementary of each other? I think in general, it's good to think of them as both supporting the concept of freedom of religion. And uh, in the New Dow case I wrote, uh, tried to explain some of those principles, but I think it's important to think that f to begin with, you're equally American no matter what religion you are, if you're no religion at all. Uh, that it's also uh, important, the Supreme Court has said, that religious people be allowed to speak enter, participate in the public square without having to sacrifice uh, their religion uh, in, in speaking in the public square, for example, or practicing their religion in the public square. At the same time, I think both clauses protect the 
idea or protect against coercing people into practicing a religion when they might be of a different religion or might be of no religion at all. So the coercion idea, I think, comes really out of, of both clauses as well. The cases that are establishment clause cases that don't involve coercion, but are some of the more, the symbol, the religious symbols cases, as you well know, Senator, that's a complicated body of law, but uh, in each probably area of that has to be analyzed in its own silo. But as a general matter, I think it's good to think of the two clauses working together for the concept of freedom of religion in the United States, which I think is foundational to the Constitution. When you were in private practice, uh, you represented the Adat Shalom uh, synagogue mm -hmm. uh, pro bono. You did that for free. Uh, can you describe for this, this committee uh, that representation and, and, and why you undertook it? Uh, I undertook that representation to help a group of people who wanted to build a synagogue but were being denied the ability to do that uh, based on a zoning ordinance that seemed to be the application, at least, of a zoning ordinance in a way uh, that seemed to be uh, discriminating against them because of their religion. And that may have allowed uh, <clears throat> other buildings to be built there, but uh, the uh, they were being blocked or at least challenged from building a synagogue there. So it seemed to me potentially a case of religious discrimination uh, that was being uh, used to try to prevent them from building. So I wanted to, uh, I, I agreed to represent them uh, because I like, I wanted to do pro bono work and I always like to help the community. In that case in particular, I thought these uh, people who want to build their synagogue uh, have the right to do so as I saw it under the law and I thought I could help them do so and we did prevail in the uh, state, in the district court in Maryland, uh, and um, that, that synagogue now stands, and they, um, you know, they were very grateful, and so that was the kind of litigation, that was the couple years I was actually at a law, a law firm, but did some pro bono work, and that was very rewarding pro bono work to have a real effect on real people in their practice of their religion uh, in the state of Maryland, so that's uh, something that uh, means a a lot to me, they gave me uh, something, uh, a thing to hang on the wall, justice, justice, shalt thou pursue, which has uh, hung on my wall in my chambers uh, the whole 12 years I've been there as just a reminder of a representation I had in the past and the importance of uh, equal treatment and religious liberty and a successful pro bono representation that meant a lot to me. Well, and I'll, I'll note some of the Democratic senators on this Hi. on this committee. Hi. Some of the Democratic senators on this committee have suggested that you would somehow side with with rich and powerful entities at the expense of the little guy. But at least in that instance, representing the synagogue against the power of government that was trying to prevent uh, prevent it being built is is very much an instance that you chose to give your your time and your energy and your labor for free uh, to a litigant that I think most would, would view as the little guy in that, in that battle. <clears throat> That's correct, Senator, and I've tried as a judge always to rule for the party who has the best argument on the merits, and that's included you know, workers in some cases, businesses in others, coal miners in some cases, environmentalists in others, uh, uh, unions in some cases, the employer in others, criminal defendants in some cases, the prosecution in others. And I have a long line of cases in each of those categories. And the little guy, big guy, is uh, not the relevant determination. If you're the little guy, so to speak, and you have the right answer under the law, then uh, you'll win in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, earlier in the questions from Senator Graham, uh, he asked you a question, are you a Republican? And, and, and he asked it in the present tense. And, and, and your answer, you acknowledged that you had been a registered Republican. Indeed, you'd served in, in a Republican uh, administration previously. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you've been a federal judge for 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, do you consider yourself a Republican judge? <clears throat> 
I'm not sure what the current registration is, but shortly after I became a judge, uh, I assume this registration, I haven't changed it, but I, was, I don't know if it's still listed, but it's shortly after I became a judge and had voted, I think, in one election, I decided, I read about the second Justice Harlan uh, having decided that he didn't want to continue voting while being a federal judge, and I thought about it, that practice, and I will be the first to say I'm not the second Justice Harlan, uh, and not trying to compare myself in any way to him, but I thought that was a good model for a federal judge, just to underscore the independence, because we're not supposed to participate in political activities, go to rallies, give money, and that kind of thing, and it seemed to me that voting is a very personal expression of your policy beliefs in many ways, and your personal beliefs, and I, I'm not let, trying to- Let me to ask one final question, because yeah. my time is expiring, and I yeah. want to end yeah. on a lighter note. Yeah. You and I have both had the joys of coaching our daughters in basketball. Um, can you tell this committee, what, what have you learned uh, coaching your daughters playing basketball? Well, uh, it's uh, been a tremendous experience to be able to coach them for the last seven years and all the girls on the team. And I've learned about something I saw in my own life, but the importance of coaches to the development of America's youth teachers too, but coaches can have such an impact, I think, on building confidence. And when you see, uh, I've coached girls, so when you see the girl develop confidence over time, or you see uh, comp their competitive spirit, the teamwork, the toughness uh, that's developed over time, the drive, uh, you know, win with class, lose with dignity, uh, winning and the, the ability to lose, but still put forth your best effort. And so I, I, I've learned um, just how important, I, I think I understood that from my own experience, as I said, but learned how important it is for people, uh, for coaches, and the effect that you can have on people's lives. And I've heard from a lot of the parents over the last eight weeks uh, while I've been in this process. Um, about uh, you know effect I had on some of the girls' lives, which was very nice to to hear in terms of my uh, my coaching. Um, so, uh, like I said yesterday, coaches uh, have such an such an impact on people, and I've learned uh, I've learned that. That's why as Senator Kennedy was said in my individual meeting. I hope you keep coaching, and I'm going to either way this comes out. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to try to keep coaching. Thank you, Senator. Thank you.